Uh, Roger, I'm, I've wanted to talk to you for so long, actually in person. It's, uh, it's interesting that we, we get this opportunity. Um, describe, first of all, uh, tell me how you got involved with this current one. I'm a big fan of Jonathan Reyes Myers ever since Ride with the Devil and uh, mm -hmm. uh, talk, Telling Lies in America, a fine young Irish actor who's really coming to his own now. He's quite brilliant in this piece. How do you get Johnny, I guess is his nickname, <laughs> how do you get Johnny in your film, which I think is to begin with. It's an amazing story, but let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, just the script. He really did like the script. and and. Uh, it's a terrific character for him, and I'd seen him in Bend It Like Beckham and, and a few films, and of course in the Woody Allen film. And I thought he was really interesting and that this was going to be something he would flower in, and he felt the same way. So that, that worked very well. And this film I came across because eight years ago, I'll, I'll get this thing up, I, somebody sent me a script, an early draft of the story about George Hogg, and it had been written by the man who wrote this book, recently I uh, called Ocean Devil, Ocean Devil yeah. which is the same story but he r this was actually made after the film this was finished after the film oh, yeah. but McManus um, as a young journalist went to Beijing for the Guardian and was asked to write pieces for an English newspaper and couldn't find a subject when he arrived and found himself after a week or two in a in a bar and overheard journalists saying that they were having to go up to Shandan a little town on the edge of the Gobi Desert where some statue was being unveiled by the Chinese government of an Englishman of all people. And an Englishman who the Chinese revered in some way, but nobody had ever heard of. And, they've, and they had to schlep their way up there. And, and, and McManus started finding out why this Englishman, who was he? And it became a lifelong quest for him. And he, he, he wrote a script which I came across and, and worked on and so forth. So how does, uh, how does Jonathan Reyes Myers become this become, uh, George Hawk? Uh, well, quite easily. I mean, you know, I mean, he, neither of them had been to China, and, and they were the same age, and uh, had energy and enthusiasm, and, and it was a challenge for Johnny, and, and he rose to it and had a great time. He has an amazing personality. Uh, talk a little bit about what he's like uh, off and on screen. Um, well, he has an energy and enthusiasm, and he, uh, he has his demons, and he has his passions, and he has some misconceptions. He, he told me very early on, you know, I, I'll make this work, but I, I, I don't get on with kids. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a, I'm not going to have children, uh, so I, I don't know that that'll. But I'll play. I'll, I'll, I'll try and act to you. And of course, he, he, he was incredibly good with children, and they've sought him out and. Uh, he, he found his way in the character very well, and, and it, it was a challenge and, and fascinating for him. He was there the whole time, and we all learned a lot about China. We worked with a Chinese crew, so it was very much a real experience of sort of plunging in and trying to find your way. He has to speak Chinese at some point. How does he do that? Is it uh, he, yeah, he learned it phonetically. It's very difficult because they, you know, from, from birth, you learn to twist your tongue in a different way, and Chinese is a tricky subject, I mean, tricky language. We, it's hard to pronounce for us, and they for, you know, they have trouble with the English language, L's and W's, and you know, they can't pronounce because their tongues are designed, have been trained to do a different thing, and he found the same thing, but he made it work, he, he and Radha, actually. Cantonese or Mandarin? Mandarin. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, now, where do, you, where do you shoot this? It's an amazing, it's amazing. It's supposed to be a 700-mile trek, from what I understand, uh, across yeah. China. Well, it, it, it was. I mean, we did it in many of the similar places. Um, we went up to the Gobi Desert. We didn't go to Shandan where he'd ended because that all of the past has been destroyed there or disappeared. It's been built over. But we did go to the Gobi Desert. We went to the soft Gobi. That's where we, you know, we, and, and we found some of those beautiful desert scenes and that's all up there. And, and then we went down to Lancho, which he had been through on the way to Shandan. And uh, three or four hours from there, we found the monastery that's at the end. So we, we, we did slowly over a, a 1,500 mile, much bigger area, we, we found bits of the past that we could turn into our story. You obviously got some cooperation from the Chinese government. They obviously liked the story. They liked the story. Then, then they step back. You don't hear any more from them. But we, we, uh, circumstances and um, and a choice 
made me want to have a Chinese crew. I wanted to go through, I wanted it to feel more Chinese. I didn't want it, I wanted it to be more Chinese. I didn't want it to be a Western film, Western crew that just comes in and finds a few locations. So my crew was, um, was the one that made Hero and House of Flying Daggers. At least the, the camera and the production design team were. So they knew, they had looked for difficult locations on big films. They'd also done uh, Curse of the Golden Flower. Oh, right. They've done, uh, Zhao Zhao Ding and uh, Mr. Huang had done all these big, complicated Chinese films where they'd spent years looking for locations. So they knew the countryside. We, t we went to very remote places and very beautiful places. We found our past uh, with them. We found these strange places and, and filmed there. One of the things that I think is uh, one of the things I think is quite wonderful is in the beginning of the film. It, it's not it's not an action film per se, although you have some wonderful set pieces, especially in the beginning, some very horrific things. It involves, of course, the the, the war of the Chinese uh, fighting the, the war against the Japanese invaders. It involves Nanking. Talk a little bit about how dangerous it was to go to Nanking, and George Hogg uh, he pulls a few strings to get there. That that's a story in itself, and he takes some photographs that almost literally got him killed. Yeah, and you do a marvelous job of encapsulating all that. Talk a little bit about that real story and, and how, how difficult it was to get it down right. Well, it was it was hard to create. I had seen, uh, for a different film, I'd seen a lot of footage of the massacre in Nanjing. I'd seen uh, Japanese home movies that they ta take in, in Nanjing. So I'd seen, I knew kind of what, many of the things that had gone on, and we recreated a little bit of Nanjing. We built that bit of Nanjing. You c there is nothing old in Nanjing either. There are a few old buildings on one street, but it's a busy street, and it's got 10 lanes of traffic. You can't shoot there. And there's no old Nanjing. You see little bits of the wall now, but you don't see what you see in our film. So we had to build that. And, um, um, but we knew what we, I knew kind of what we were creating, because I'd seen footage that, uh, not been seen for 50 years, and I, I happened to have come across it a few years back. And so it was not so impossible, it was just difficult to create something that quite big and elaborate on a small independent film budget. But it, And it, the film isn't about the war, but it takes place on the edge of the war. Yeah. And we bump into it occasionally, and I wanted the, the, our story to do that. It's a very small character drama, and hopefully you, you really are interested in the people, but occasionally it bumps into a bigger story. So I just wanted it, I had to keep that. Did any of those fil photographs that almost cost him his life actually survive, or do, was that, had, you had to imagine what he took? We had to imagine what he took. Yeah, because I, I know he was, I, I love the way Johnny plays it, you know, yeah. the way he gets those photographs, because he's watching mass executions and yeah. things that you would get killed if you, yeah, if you yeah, yeah. Yeah. Japanese had a yeah, great uh, yeah, interest yeah. in not letting that get out. Well, and yet, strangely enough, they they let their own soldiers do that. They yeah. they own soldiers had little sixteen mil cameras, and they took this film. Yeah. They sent them home to their families, but the uh, war ministry confiscated them, and they kept them. And by chance, the American troops, when they came into Tokyo, and took all the documents out of the war ministry, they took tons of papers, and unbeknownst to them, they also took half a ton of old films. And they've been sitting on an American base for 60 years. And that's considered one of the, the most horrendous war crimes of that theater of the war, right? It is, yes. Uh, it's also an event that the Japanese, to this day, say did not happen. Talk about the kids. How, uh, who, does, uh, who are these kids that George Hogg actually finds? Because they're quite marvelous themselves. Um, well, as in the story, many of them were orphans. Not all of them, most of them were orphans. They were peasant kids from... Uh, from in local areas, and uh, he came across them, and he looked after them, and he took them on this tremendous march. And in fact, he spent longer. Than we, he dies immediately in the film, but in fact, he he was alive a little longer. And that school was there much longer, and that school uh, provided, and he provided them with an extraordinary education, a sense of knowledge, anyway, and a desire to learn, and they did learn, and he gave them skills. And so of the 60 kids he walked across China in 1938, um, 39, 40 of the 60 are still alive. It's a remarkable thing, and they're very, very eloquent about him, and they still show up every year, and they celebrate him, and they talk about what an amazing thing it was. 
it's their own small Schindler's List, I guess, in it, some ways. Yeah. Yeah. They don't see, yes, they don't talk about it, but they, they are so, they're proud of having been there. They think he was remarkable, and they go and celebrate him every year. Now, he took them to a really remote place. He says in the film that uh, th we've got to go to some place where nobody wants to fight over this, there's, there's, where the war, well, we have to escape the war, literally speaking, by going to the most remote, awful place in the world. Nobody will think to chase us. Yeah, well, he'd seen the Japanese kill children and women, and and uh, he, and and he just thought, I have to be so far away, no one will come, and he picked a place that nobody would want to go to. <laughs> it was so far, and it's right on the edge of the desert. It's a tough place, the Gobi Desert, beautiful but hard to get to, and indeed, they the war never came there. Talk about is the nurse, the the Australian nurse, was she based on somebody real? So there was a there was a nurse. I, I, she was Australian, I think. And um, but our our character is based more on somebody I met, who actually wasn't Australian. She was English. She told me there were Australians there. She I I happened to long before I was knew about this film. I met this the, a woman who who had gone there kind of as an adventure, gone to China in the early 30s, and had, the war had overtaken her, and she had helped in a, in a field hospital as a nurse and been very good at it and found that they needed people. And she stayed and stayed and stayed. And then they realized there were no, you know, at some point in the war, the surgeons were all dead or died. And she started being a field surgeon. And by the time I met her, the war was over, of course. But she was a very accomplished surgeon doctor, and still living in China without any papers, any credentials, as she was the first person to say. She was entirely self-taught, but she was an extremely experienced person and uh, very respected, had a pension in China and, and visited back in England, but she said she could never move back to England because in England she couldn't work, she couldn't do anything, she wasn't, you know, she had nothing, she was just a... Talk about the Chinese, her Chinese, communist Chinese lover, too. The, the very heroic film. Talk about the actor who plays him, too. It's amazing. That's an amazing character as well. Uh, Yun Fan. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, the, the, he again is, uh, he, he's more of a fictional character, although there were people like him. There were the sons of intellectuals and, and wealthy people. They were educated abroad in Europe or in America, and many of them came back and, join, and, and joined the revolution and were a rather different kind of revolutionary, and, and actually later on were consumed by the revolution, and most of them were destroyed by Mao. But there were these uh, odd characters who, who joined in early on and helped. They came back from America or from Europe and helped. And of course, there were two parallel revolutions. There were the nationalists and the communists who sort of got along. Yeah, talk a little bit about they, that. They did at times, and the, they were in the middle of a, a, they were fighting each other, and then the Japanese arrived, and they, um, and they jo joined forces, but it was a very uneasy and day-to-day -day, uh, collaboration. And some days they would, you know, they would go after each other, and other days they would join together against the Japanese. So it was a very uncomfortable alliance. And, um, and George Hodd had now with both of them, in a certain sense. Yes, yes. Uh, he was kind of non-political. There was an, a New Zealander there as well who was more political and more more closely aligned with the communists. But they were both both of them were essentially teachers, educators. They had come there with no intention to be those things, but they became uh, close to their children and they tried to steer a path whereby they could look after their protégés and uh, stay enough out of politics and yet be enough, you know, acceptable to both sides that they would be live and let live, that they would be allowed to be there. And the danger to the kids was not only the Japanese war machine, but the fact that both of the competing armies might muster them into, they, they might become child soldiers like in Africa today. Absolutely. Yeah. Both, both of them, uh, both armies took young kids, particularly the nationalists, they were famous for it. So that, that was as much a danger as the Japanese. And so he had, he had to be very diplomatic and kind of uh, seeing yeah, that they did, yeah, the kids yeah, became, yeah. stayed kids. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, um, how did you, what was the basis of the research? Uh, was, it, was the memories of the children themselves? And uh, how, how uh, where does most, much of the knowledge of this uh, episode come from? Much of it comes from the children. Um, there, are, there are a few letters from Hogg. There's a book by him. Um, there are, J James McManus has written a book now uh, putting together all of his research, he slowly put it, you know, pieced together what he can. Uh, 
Hogg got sent only one or two letters a year and received only a few letters. It was very hard to get mail during the during the war. Um, but he slowly, through the children a lot, he's he's pieced together the whole story. And I, uh, I had also worked on a film that never got made, based on Andre Malraux's book *Man's Fate*. La condition humaine. A friend of mine, Carol Rice, a wonderful filmmaker was going to direct that. After Fred Zinnemann's version of it collapsed, a few years later, Carol was offered it and spent two years on a script, and I helped him slightly, peripherally, but I worked with him and, and saw a lot of his research and so forth. So that was set at the same time, so, uh, or 34, 35. So I, I'd, I'd become uh, intrigued by this period uh, through, the, through the Malraux book. There were a few of the kids who were older, who were much, who were more psychologically damaged, who actually gave Hogg a hard time. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, what that's based on. Uh, that's just based on on some of the of the of the survivors saying that they were a mixed group, and some of them found it more easy to get along and to learn than others. So there, there was such a big age range, but they they did all work together. But I think some of them had more difficulties, uh, were more damaged by the war than others. And in, in, in the end, uh, Hogg dies of uh, tetanus, is it? Yeah. And uh, Hogg actually died a little later, but he did die of tetanus. Tetanus was very prevalent in China at the time. And uh, there, wa there, was, uh, there was medication, but it, people ran out of it very easily. It, you know, two or three kids get hurt, and you've used up all your medication, and getting supplies was very difficult. So um, many people died of tetanus. What is, your, what is your belief uh, is the pivotal moment where Hogg goes from being a photojournalist, a, a, a kind of war adventurer himself, to becoming this, human, this kind of backdoor humanitarian, his own version of Schindler? I mean, it, it's, a curi it's a curious story. Somebody, somebody has to go, somebody has to find something in themselves, but somebody has to go through some kind of a change. You depict it well in the film. What do you think actually happened? And was that a challenge to, to make that credible? I think Johnny makes it a, uh, his trans, he, he's, so, he's such a ferocious character character in some ways, that he, I think he, he does a very nice job with the transformation. But talk a little bit about what you suspect it might have been. I, I think he, uh, he really sympathized with the, 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 these very rural Chinese. He sort of understood that they were him more. There was a part of him in them, that they were more similar than he imagined, that they were, or that, that others would imagine, that they had a connection. and he. And, and that his heart and his future lay with these people who, although they were completely different and he still didn't speak their language yet, uh, they had a kind of boldness and attack and he rather liked that and he sort of thought that was in him. And I think he saw them more as cousins. It's interesting that when they talk about him, they don't talk about him very much as a foreigner. They talk about him as being them as being, you know, there was this guy who helped us. And you don't... Of Lawrence of Arabia and that. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and yes. But I, but I think that's what makes those great adventures, that they, they see in strangers, they see connections, they find ways to talk to them in a way that makes everyone open up to themselves. Instead of being afraid and, and having all these preconceptions that the person, the stranger you've just met, it will kill you or do terrible things, they immediately see bonds that are invisible, but they could easily share, and they go about finding them. And the, it, it's a very engaging quality when you meet when you meet strangers, when you travel a lot, and you see that some people get are incredibly good at immediately making friends with complete strangers with whom they, in theory, have nothing in common. And within an hour or two, they found a whole bunch of things in common. And they start learning about other cultures. And it's a wonderful quality, because it's so easy for us to be afraid of what we don't know. It's just as easy if you have the courage to be embrace what you don't know. And, and There also seems to be a bit of the British character is reflected in the empire. Orwell reflects it some, when he's a Burmese police officer. All of this, there's something about the British colonial experience, as cruel and brutal as it was, that produced these extraordinary people. Sometimes the Lawrences, the Kitcheners, the the Orwells, and and the Hogs. Uh, there, there were some extraordinary people who, in some ways, went native. They they they, yeah. they got more out of it than their than their compatriots and from other colonial nations. I know it's odd. I don't know what it is in that character, and whether it's being British or whether it's just that they are. There were so many British who were exploring the world that yeah. 
that there were oddballs in, amongst them. I, I think the elder Fines, not Ray Fines' father, I think he must be like that. He's a mountaineer and things, yeah, but he seems yeah. to be a great adventurer, embraces strange people, gets in, on in different cultures, gets taken to unusual places because people want to show him. Yeah. They recognize kindred, unusual spirits. In some respects, uh, we just, we've just we just seen the John Adams series on HBO. In some respects, the fathers of our revolution are a little bit, have share that same gene. Because we forget this is one of the unique revolutions where the people who revolted were the people they were revolting from. There was almost no difference between the people doing the revolting and the people they were revolting from. It was a unique kind of revolution in that sense. And so, so it's cast that same, we're so we're cast in that same uh, mode in some ways. It's odd because I often think that the Irish and the English are in the way. I mean, nobody's revolted from each other, but there's been a war, which is just a war of terrorism that's just ended. Yeah. And the English and the Irish have this complicated love-hate relationship, and they are the same people, almost the same people. What joins them together is so much greater than what could possibly separate them, and yet they were dropping bombs on each other yeah, exactly. recently. Yeah. And, and yeah, Johnny is Irish, of course. Johnny's Irish. How, does that re how is that reflected in him? Uh, I don't know. He's a poet. I guess he's got that little bit of the, of the lyric in him, uh, the storyteller, and um, I don't know. He's just, he's, he could be English or Irish, but he is Irish. He's very Irish. He's yeah. very busy these days. How does he get a chance to do this film? It takes a while in, in between being Henry VIII yeah. and everything else he's being <laughs> these days. <laughs> it's, he's become extraordinarily busy, and he's shooting something right now. Um, but he, he, he loves working. He, he, he likes to be working. He just wants to work and work and work. And, and I think it keeps him, keeps him together. And he has lots of demons, and he's trying to deal with them. And I think this work is a great way to deal with them. I wanted to, to talk a little bit about your back pages with Sam Peckinpah and also your own extraordinary two gay films that you've made, The Matthew Shepard Story and uh, and The Band Played On. I knew Randy Schultz. Uh, I, I was a sort of a colleague of his, so I had a little bit of insight into that. A couple of things I wanted to touch base with. I finished reading uh, David Waddell's uh, Sam Peckinpah, uh, If It Moves, Shoot It. Uh, the, the very, it's, a very, it, it's a very vivid account of, of uh, Sam Peckinpah's life, who's quite an extraordinary person. I put off until last night watching Straw Dogs. I've never seen Straw Dogs before. I saw it last night. It was a film that for some reason I was allergic to. I'm a gay man. And I thought it was something I wouldn't like. And then I finally watched it last night. And it's quite amazing because uh, it feeds into the way you shoot uh, the opening of the Matthew Shepard story. Talk about the experience of editing Straw Dogs, which for uh, for people who don't know, is this extraordinary early 70s Peckinpah, one of his few non-Westerns, in some ways is more violent than his Westerns. And and really, uh, it encapsulates a lot of the man himself and his very peculiar take on, on human nature. Talk a little bit about your, your insights into, into um, editing Straw Dogs, because for its time, it was quite a violent film, both emotionally as well as physically. Um, well, it was a, it, it's hard to talk. It was, it was a very strange experience. We edited that um, entirely away from the rest of the world. We brought it to Hollywood. We finished shooting in England. It was brought to Hollywood. Uh, we cut away for months and months, actually for a year, on the film. And uh, it was extraordinarily violent. Uh, we, it took an incredibly long time because the ending alone, the last 20 minutes, what you see is the last 20 minutes, was cut by someone in England, and it was over two hours in length. Wow. And Sam, I remember driving it up, flying and driving to Prescott, Arizona, where he was shooting uh, Junior Bonner and the editor in England sent, just sent us this. We had this 10 or 12 reels of the ending alone. And there was Sam drinking on a Sunday morning in Prescott, Arizona. And um, we ran half a reel on a moviola. And he stopped the movie and he said, how long is this? And we said, well, Sam, it's, uh, it's about two hours. He said, Jesus Christ. Yeah. He said, well, I, I don't want to see it. I want to see it. Uh, cut it in half. Don't take anything out. Not a single shot. Take nothing out, but make it half the length, OK? I'll see you in a few weeks. And we came back in a few weeks, and the film uh, uh, was half the length. And, and, and he puts, we showed him in the movie. Oh, and he gets through half a reel. He says, how long is this thing? Did you shorten it? I said, yeah, Sam. It's, yeah, it's six and a half reels. It was 12. He said, OK, OK. Um, I don't want to see it. I want you to cut it in half, 
and uh, take nothing out. I, you know what will happen. If you take one fucking shot out, I'll find out and I'll get you, okay? Take nothing out. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Not a shot. Okay, that's not possible. So it's possible. You do it, okay? So we go away and we come back and it's 35 or 32 minutes long and we run it and he sees it the whole time, for, for the whole way through, for the first time. And he says, oh, well, we're getting there. He says, now I want, you, I want you to cut it in half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you know, you can take nothing out. <laughs> and it became 18 minutes anyway. And it, it was a very strange experience. And he was a very strange man. Obsessed, I mean, it, it's not enough to say he was obsessed. He was, he was this man, he's from locally here. He's from the Central Valley, basically, of, of rancher stock. And, he, and that's an important part of his life. Uh, his own demons come, are, are rooted in the California soil. Uh, what do you think that film expresses for him? I thought that the Dustin Hoffman character was quite extraordinary. The Dustin Hoffman was one of the great actors of his time in the De Niro Pacino mold, and he really goes through a transformation that you can kind of see on screen. It's scary, it's strange, it's, it's like no other. It makes the whole thing credible, and I, I've kind of put my finger on what it is he does exactly. Well, I, I think what Sam was showing, uh, what he showed in mo many of the films, was that everyone is a mixture of all of these things. There is no one who is not violent. We all have a violence in us. We all have all of these colors in us, all of these madnesses. And how we deal with them is what makes us different. And, uh, and it, rightly or wrongly, uh, we have to confront those darknesses within ourselves, and, and we become the richer and the more complicated for it. If we pretend it's not there, it's unrealistic. So he was always looking for all the different facets of characters, and, and Dustin Hoffman is this pacifist who becomes this <laughs> major killer. And we we finished that film. Uh, you can't do this now. We finished it. We spent a year, and we decided together that that was it. Just Sam and me and, and Garth and I think Dan. And he said, okay, well, we're going to make a print. You know, We'll finish it and we'll dub it. And at that time, we could. He didn't have to show it to the studio or anyone. So there was a huge sound job, and we mixed it. The negative was cut. And it had never been shown to anyone, not to friends, not to anyone. So a year has gone by since the end of the shoot, and the film is completely finished, final print. And we come to San Francisco, and we go to Fisherman's Wharf, and we run it. And we have become immune to it. You know, we know it's very strong and violent, but we don't quite know how we've got used to it. We've had our arguments. We've refused to cut in some shots that were so unbelievably impossible. We've had our fights. Anyway, there we are. We have the finished film. And 400 people are in the cinema here. And during the next two hours, 260 people walked out, not one of them silently. People got up starting after 10 or 15 minutes when the bear trap was, and you know, early on they start standing up saying, this is vicious, violent, this is outrageous. They storm out. And um, um, we, and the lights come up at the end and there's this small audience left and they're, they're silent. Uh, a man comes up to Sam. I'm standing with him near the screen, I'm with Dan, and, and the guy comes up, and he's sort of shaking, and, but you can't tell quite what it's about. And he, he said, who's responsible? And Dan reads it wrong and thinks it's going to be nice. So he said, well, actually, I, I'm, I'm the producer. <laughs> and the guy said, this is the most appalling, disgraceful I read. And Dan immediately said, but, uh, but Sam is the director. You should talk to him. <laughs> and the guy goes for Sam, <laughs> tries to hit him. And Sam takes off for the exit by the screen, and the guy goes after him. And Dan and I run up in the other direction, right up through, out through the front of the cinema to the limo that's waiting. We get in the limo, we roar around the back, and uh, head down the alley behind the cinema. And there is Sam running from the sky, who's trying to kill him. And we get Sam into the car, and Sam climbs down, and we're all sort of glad to be going. And he says, well, we got their attention. We don't have to change the film. <laughs> we didn't. The guy said he called you fucking pornographers and all yeah, this stuff. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And that was it. Anyway, that, the, the censor took a little bit out, took a minute and a half of the rape scene out, but, but the film was unchanged. And ABC in those days had the courage. Can you imagine a modern studio that has half the audience, more than half the audience walks out noisily, and the director says, I'm not changing it. That's okay. <laughs> The rape scene was, is controversial in itself, especially at yeah. that time. It was very intense. 
and Susan George, the actor, the actor had to go undergo a, a real psychological thing with Sam in some ways. Talk a little bit about that and, and what was what had to be cut out. What did you guys think of having to cut out? Uh, it they they didn't make it better by shortening it. I mean, they didn't, but they found it offensive and. Uh, I don't know, two minutes were taken out. And it seemed, it, there, were t there were two rapes, and there still are, but the second one was more explicit. But the first one is a violent rape, and the second one was a person who had once been her lover, and he sort of comes in and, and has her after the first guy. And she sees him and, and sort of accepts it, and, said, and it was considered politically incorrect because, because it was suggesting or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe yeah, he was the first one. It's the other way around. Exactly, yes, yeah, it was the first one. And it was considered suggesting that women liked rape, which was not what Sam was doing. It was actually the other way around. But uh, so they they shortened the scene, and actually, actually, in the end, it it backfired. It it made the film worse, not better. Um, but you know, that was uh, the censor insisted on it, and it was taken out, and. Um, Women hated the film anyway, so. <laughs> it did you little good. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't do anyone any good. In England, they did not take it out. Uh, they ran the film as it was, and then were so criticized for having not censored it that they didn't show the film again. It didn't, in those days, films went to VHS um, within a year or two and would be on cable television and things. And it was 20 years before the film was on VHS. Uh, like Clockwork Orange, they were the only two films that were never put onto, and uh, at least not for 20 years, were put. And so, two years ago, Clockwork Orange and Straw Dogs appeared on DVD for the first time. I wanted to make a segue now to your own, uh, I think, a marvelous The Matthew Shepard story. I, uh, it was the first time I'd covered a made-for-television film. Goldie Hawn produced it. And of course, writing for a gay newspaper, it was a very, very important subject. I remember when I first heard the news of Matthew's death, and uh, I was, I was on a, doing a radio program at the time and heard it on the newscast and actually cried at the time. And I remember <coughs> popping the VHS that I'd just gotten from the studio into the machine and watching it, not knowing what I was going to see, and seeing this first extraordinary scene, which I try to cover in my article. And I, there was something about that that struck me. I said, there, there's something about the energy behind this scene. And, I really think, and, and then when later I learned you had edited Straw Dogs, one of the editors of Straw Dogs, I thought, this, this is quite amazing. He's, got, he's captured something, some real demon here. Talk a little bit about how, I mean, you didn't write the script, but you certainly wrote that scene, because that, the scene is something quite astonishing. Talk about, uh, you, you, get, you really capture the essence of Sam Peckinpah, I think, in, in this Matthew Shepard movie. Talk about how you do this, how it's shot with a young actor, too, who's quite extraordinary. Talk a little bit about the evolution of that, because I think it's one of the, the great moments in made-for-TV movies, which is a genre not well-respected sometimes, but I think this one really rises to quite an extraordinary level. Well, thank you. It, it's um, the scene came out of what happened, so I knew what had happened. It was in the report, and the you know the guy pistol whipped him with a very big gun on that fence, and I visited the fence, and I knew exactly what it was, and I made another one, and I went out to shoot it, and I I didn't want to shoot it because I mean I don't like violence, so I you know it's hard to do. On the other hand, I wanted it to be I wanted it to be. Uh, as horrible as it, um, as it was, and, uh, and as memorable, and I thought that the censors couldn't stop me, to be honest. I thought, if I make it absolutely accurate, uh, this is, they're going to have a hard argument, they're going to have a tough time, and they didn't try and do it. And, uh, and that's one of those cases where, having worked with Sam, I knew, how, I mean, I didn't know, I mean, I knew, I shot it in, I don't know, some sort of slow motion, but some, and I changed the, um, the camera, shutter and things and it, it, it was not hard to do but it was we I knew how to do it and it, it, it we shot it in one evening very quickly and it was very hard and unpleasant to do but it looked riveting and it is riveting and it's horrifying and it's really horrifying I think not because of what I did but because it's true and you know that and you know something about it I've, I've done a number of things I did something about R Dallaire in Rwanda uh, a couple of years ago and I did something in Under Fire. If you, 
do things, if you find out what really happened and you do it that way, sometimes those events are so interesting and so extraordinary, maybe mundane or strange or something, and if you just allow the reality, you don't have to tell people it's real, there will be something about it that people will know. And uh, that's a scene that I think is probably very, very like what happened. And I just put it on film, and it somehow people know and it's a bad feeling, it becomes a very powerful f piece of film, not because of what I did, but because they smell truth in it. You, it sort of reverberates in some strange... Talk about that young actor, Shane Mayer, the Canadian actor yeah. who plays Matthew Shepard, brings to that movie. Yeah, it's he, he, a, a really good performance. He's very, very good, and he was very sympathetic of what he was doing. And he understood it, and actually the person who attacks him was extremely good. And um, so together they, they created something very special. And Shane was he's a very good actor. And throughout the film, he was very, very strong. And there's a lot of scenes with him. And he's powerful, more so than I think he has been since then. I, I haven't seen all, everything he's done. But, uh, but so were the other, you know, the, the other two. It must have been hard to shoot that, because he's like, he's like a, it was a rag doll at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was hard. And it was a bitterly cold night, and we were out. in the middle of nowhere and it was cold and raining and horrible. Where was it actually shot? That was shot in uh, Wyoming, not in Wyoming, in Drumheller, yeah. in, uh, in that place um, where the dinosaurs are, in uh, uh, Manitoba, Alberta. It, it's just, there's something, that, there's something about that. And, and, the, and the decision, of course, for it to be the very first thing we see. It happened that night that uh, NBC had been uh, running a Steven Spielberg retrospective on E.T. And in the modern scene of television, they don't have these formal station breaks like they used to have when we were growing up. It, you just go directly from the E.T. 20th anniversary right into the Matthew Shepard, and it's like, Cron for San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, and you just you just go right from Steven Spielberg to the death of Matthew Shepard, with almost no interruption at all, which makes it all the more powerful because it's in prime time and everything. Mm -hmm. So you have your young ET crowd still hanging around on NBC watching the Matthew Shepard story, and you immediately drop into the story. As, as I said in my article, like a bat had swooped down and it was photographing the thing. Well, I, I I didn't see it that night. So I didn't see what I didn't see how the timing worked, but it, it is a powerful story, and it it's uh, that is an extraordinary opening, and it's it's uh, it's a, also a very interesting subject because it's about uh, about him, and it's about forgiveness, and it's about acceptance, it's about the speech that the parents gave, because it's all framed around the speech they have to write that will get the death sentence for the killers, and. Um, Sam Waterston, uh, the two of them are very, very terrific, I think, in the film. And later, there, there was an episode of an ABC show that tried to exploit uh, the subject, and it was somewhat controversial that reporters actually got into the prison, I think, and talked to those guys, talked to McKinney and, and Henderson, in really breaking the spirit of, of, the, of, the, of the plea bargain in some ways. I didn't know they had. Yeah. That is breaking the spirit of yeah. the plea bargain, yeah. They said they would never talk yeah, about exactly. it, yeah, Something yeah. Later, there's an ABC special oh, really? reflecting that. Yeah. It was quite, the, quite, quite astonishing. What did you come away with with the Matthew Shepard story? I mean, you bring so much to it. You know, it becomes, let's say, this extraordinary uh, document. And uh, was it, did anything have to be left out because of the demands of the time slot and everything? Was, was everything, you were able to get everything? Yeah, no, everything was there. Um, I, I I just I I I found the the story so compelling and him so compelling as a person that uh, it, the same with the band played on that was such a remarkable to immerse oneself in the lives of the of other people and to understand what had happened to them is a, a privilege and it's interesting and 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 compelling and and so I found that. Extraordinary. I also thought the parents were extraordinary, that they were, you know, sort of right wing and illiberal and they had trouble with their gay son and they'd sort of come to accept him. But, uh, and then they wanted re revenge, of course, and who wouldn't? And then in writing the speech, they couldn't write it. They had trouble writing the speech. And then they write this extraordinary thing 
the shooting of that was interesting. The, the scene where uh, Sam Waterston reads the speech, he's the most prepared and terrific and nice actor in the world, you know? And I, I, I lit, I was in a real courtroom and you don't need, you know, there's a witness stand and that's where he stood, so I didn't have to have him there for rehearsal. I just said, look, we'll light it and come in. So we lit the thing, and of course, one you know, normally you shoot the master first, and then you go in for coverage. You do the wide shots and then the close-ups. And um, so we lit lit the whole big room, and there's the cameras at the back, and there you know two cameras, and we're ready to go. Sam comes in, and he comes in with the script, with the pages, but it's not the script, but it's pages with the speech written on it. And uh, I go up to him and I said, Sam, do you? Do you, did you, do you need to have a little more time with this? He said, no, no, I don't know it. But he wrote it the night before. He didn't learn it. I know he, I know he couldn't have learned this. He wrote it, so he read it, so I'm going to read it. I said, oh, you're, you're absolutely right. So I we got the cameras going, I called action, and he got halfway through his first sentence, and it was so extraordinary, it was so interesting, because he was finding his way through his own speech, uh, that I called cut. <laughs> I thought, this, I'm doing this all wrong. He's exactly right, and I'm doing it wrong. And I said, Sam, I'm so sorry, but this is brilliant, and I'm in a wide shot back here, so I'm going to do this the other way around. You have to go away for <laughs> half an hour. I'm going to shoot the close-up first. And then we'll shoot the wide shot. Do you mind? He said, no, no, that's fine. So we dismantled everything we'd done. We put the camera, two cameras, right on him in close-up. And he read the thing, and it's one take. You know, that's it. And that's what you see. I mean, I shot the wide shots afterwards, but it's such an extraordinary speech, and it so much has the feeling of a father who's been incapable of really loving his son the way he wanted to, but then has somehow found his way there, and now is so full of bitterness, and now is trying to find this extraordinary journey of, of misunderstanding, then understanding, and then anger, and then terrifying, that he has to find hum humility and forgiveness, and then the need for forgiveness. It's such a story of tragedy of so many people's lives, of a journey of, you know, of extremes and trying to find a middle way, trying to find a place, a human response that's fair and, and reasoned and yet accepts that we all have different feelings. And I thought the father's speech was extraordinary and, and Sam's reading of it. Um, Another thing so that struck me <coughs> always was the scene where Matthew's in the bathtub. Uh, uh, Shane Mary's in the bathtub and his neighbors are ba basically screaming at him through the walls and, and everything falls down. Talk a little bit about his th that breakdown he has and which leads, of course, yeah. to that long drug binge and everything, yeah, yeah. which is an extraordinary personal take on Matthew Shepard that you were able to get. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the bits of that came out of... I, I met people who knew him uh, in Colorado and I spent quite a bit of time with them and it was very interesting, and it was, I learned a lot, you know, little fragments about him, and, and, and was able to pass those on to him, and that scene was very interesting. It, it's, a, it's a good scene, and, and he was so good in it. That I, and I always find if you can find little bits of, fragments of the real people, and it, it's so good for actors, in that, and a, a very talented actor can build on that and can create a character. Yeah, because he was able to do it virtually by himself. He's yeah. he's virtually naked in the scene, yeah. uh, and you yeah. see there's yeah. nobody really with him. No. So it's it's a solo piece. It's very very difficult, and he does it wonderfully. Yeah. It's like an earthquake overtakes his life in some yeah. respects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it, it's just it's just uh, extraordinary. Yeah. What kind of reaction did you get to that film? It must have been because it was on television. Yeah. It must have gotten a reaction. It was it was very positive. It was very good. It was very nice. I want to talk too because I saw for the first time Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, which is another one that you got to work on with with with, uh, with Sam Peckinpah, which is an extraordinary personal and in some respects quite erotic uh, depiction of the myth of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Because as as, some, as the biographer said, it is really a kind of a love story which ends in an erotic murder, basically a kind of pristine erotic murder uh, between James Coburn and Chris Christopherson. Talk about and it's a controversial film because it was hacked to pieces by James. James Audrey, the, the, the monster of MGM at the time, and then it's been lovingly pieced back together again. And so the film itself has its own legend in some ways. Uh, there's so many stories, and, and my friend Paul put it 
back together again, I think very wonderfully. It was stolen while we were in the cutting room. Um, I, I came in one day and, and the film had disappeared. They, we kept the film picture on one level and would sound on another, and I came in and there was no picture. And we thought maybe it's gone for transfer, and we called around, we couldn't find it anywhere. And it slowly dawned on me, I went over to, see, to Sam's office, and I said, you know, Sam, I, I have to tell you, there's been a theft. And uh, the film's gone, it's been stolen. Uh, I know the studio's after it, the studio's changing it, they're gonna mangle it and all of these things, but in the meantime, the work prints disappeared. He, and he <laughs> looked at me without an expression, he said, well, that's a damn shame. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's kind of, it is kind of a damn shame, Sam. The thing is, Sam, it, as, you, as you remember, it's picture and sound, and whoever stole it forgot about the sound, so the sound's still in the cutting room. And I know that as soon as I report this, which I can't do today, because uh, I just, I, I got so much to do, I'll have, but I'll report it tomorrow, and they're gonna come and change the locks and the things, you know, it's gonna be impossible tomorrow to get it. But I know that uh, at the moment, the sound is still here, and nobody, uh, the thief missed it. I didn't know about it. And uh, it's, a, it's a damn shame that whatever they got ain't worth anything. <laughs> that night, of course, the sound was stolen. <laughs> and we continued, we made a new work print and all of that, but that print went into somebody's garage and disappeared for 30 years. So, and then it came out and it became the basis of the new, of the new old version and Paul looked after it and, and put it back together. And it is this wonderful dance between the two of them. And it, it was always a very, it was a, a non-commercial script, you know, it was a beautiful story, it was a lyrical dance between these two people who are connected in some way. And uh, Sam had done it lovingly and, and uh, it was a lovely film and Aubrey had got it into a mad rage that he had to destroy it, that he didn't want it. And they did their best to destroy it. And uh, from the point of view of a gay paper in particular, uh, it appears watching it that Pat Garrett himself is kind of uh, emotionally and erotically blocked. He, he, he can't have sex with his own wife, and there's an interesting scene where there's one scene with his wife domestically. It shows the, the messed up relationship that, they, uh, that they're sharing. Uh, Billy is quite expressive, violently and erotically, and there's a great love scene that he has with a young woman just before he's shot. And it's almost as if Pat Garrett is breaking into the bedroom and, 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 and taking the love that he that he can't take and, and he takes them the only way he can with the gun and it, there's a strange thing about the violation of their friendship and and two men expressing each other uh, love for each other carnally and the fatefulness of, of Billy waiting for this for the for the executioner in some respects all of these themes just come come go through it in a way that's quite extraordinarily vivid especially for a masculine dominated medium like the Western I don't quite know how all of that came together for Sam because he had so many different ways of creating things. Some of it's in the script. Some of it I was involved in in a, in a different way, uh, peripherally maybe, but um, uh, he used life in, in, in his work. You know, thing, He would create theater around him and bits of that would get into the film. Somewhere during the shoot of the film, he shot up my cutting room one evening when I wasn't there. And my assistants were working late, and he and some friends came in and did some target practice in the, in the hall where the cutting room was. And they somehow, they shot up a lot of the wiring, a lot of the windows to the cutting room. And it was a real mess. And, and the assistants all wanted to quit, and I went to see Sam and got pissed off with him at, on the set and, and quit. I said, if you're going to shoot the cutting room, I'm, I'm going to fucking leave. I'm a, I, you call me a chicken shit Englishman? I am, okay? I am. So I'm out of here. And he says, well, fuck you, leave. So okay, I say, well, fuck you, I am leaving. So anyway, I get on, I book a plane to leave, and, and the first one out of Durango is in three days' time. The morning I'm leaving, on Sunday morning, Katie, his secretary, calls me and says, you can't leave without saying goodbye to Sam. You've got to see good Sam. And I said, fuck Sam, I'm not seeing him. I'm getting on the fucking plane. If you want to see me, you can come. She said, no, Roger, right, come see him. I agree to go see him on the drive to the airport. I go to the hacienda, I walk up to the front door, it's open. I knock, a maid runs across I, I see through the uh, half-open door, a maid runs across the lobby, points upwards, 
and vanishes, and just as I'm opening the door, there's a gunshot, right? So, all right, he's upstairs and he's shooting, okay? So I go upstairs, and feeling like a complete idiot, I know his, where his bedroom is, I go to the bedroom door, but I don't go through it. I stand by the wall, right, with my back to the wall, brick, and I say, Sam, no reply, Sam, I'm here. I, I am a chicken shit. I don't want to get shot at, so I'm going to come in. So there's another big, big, loud bang, right? And falling glass. Fuck you. So I push open the door, and there is Sam, and he's in a bed, right? Up there, facing the door with a gun, naked. He's on the bed, naked. He's got a bottle of vodka between his thighs, and he's got this big fucking magnum, right? And I'm down there, and I look along the wall where I just heard the glass, and there's a mirror. There's a mirror. And of course, in the mirror, as I sort of peer around, he is in the mirror, right? He's lying in the bed, he's looking at himself in the mirror, and he's shooting his fa himself in the mirror. It's the end of the film. Oh, yes. And I'm leaving him. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're lovers, or, or you know, but... Um, so I say, okay, I'm, I'm going to come and say fucking goodbye, and that's it, all right? And you fucking shoot me, and I'll shoot you back. I don't have a gun, but <laughs> I'm a coward, and I don't want to get shot at. And I walk up, and of course, he cannot resist. Just as I get to the bed, he shoots again, not at me, but past me. And I had no idea. I was naive, but I'd never been shot at near. And of course, it's a huge whack as the bullet goes by you. And another bit of the fucking mirror goes down. And he says, sit the fuck down. How can you leave? And I said, I can leave because, you know, we, we've sort of reached the end of the road. He says, fuck your end of the fucking road, have a drink. <laughs> no. And, you know, and, and somewhere in that, in the next few minutes, I cave in and I sip the fucking vodka. And he says, come on, let's talk about it. And, he, and then he looks at himself in the mirror and he shoots again. <laughs> and, that, and then when the dailies come in with the ending, what wasn't in the script was that Garrett shoots himself, that in killing Billy, yeah. he knows he's killing himself. And somehow Sam acts this stuff out with somebody who becomes a sort of a useful tool, and that was me in this case. <laughs> and, and he's getting drunk and doing this, and he, I'm leaving, and he's going to get me back. And, I, and, and he sees in it also, in the theater he's creating, he's trying out what he feels inside the material, and that's and then he shoots it. And it, it was what made a lot of his material fascinating. That he could he created theater around himself. He endlessly fired people. He had these volatile relationships. It was love hate. He divorced all his wives and then remarried them. 